Pong was a smash hit. Unlike the other games we've talked about in this series, Space War, Computer Space, the Sumerian game, the Magnavox Odyssey, it gained enough traction to break through into the public consumer consciousness. Why did it succeed where earlier games wallowed in relative obscurity? It was simpler than the games that came before, controlled by a single dial instead of a thrust, rotation, and hyperspace of computer space, but also addictive and social, making it a perfect match for the working class bars and pool halls that hosted the coin-op games of the day. More than that, though, it had the air of cutting-age technology about it. When Atari released the game in late 1972, we'd only landed on the moon three years ago, and public interest in technology and computers was higher than ever. Pong felt like the future. Perhaps, more importantly, it lacked the stigma that it linked pinball to gambling, enabling it to grow to reach higher class venues than traditional electromechanical arcade machines. As a result, demand was so high that Atari was able to sell machines for cash up front in an industry where the norm was to give distributors a few months' credit to sell or return product. This demand enabled Atari to keep production constant, despite their lack of financing, and by the end of their first fiscal year, they'd pulled in over $3 million in sales, reinvesting all of it into more product. Remember, though, Atari was a small startup at this point. Introducing the most popular arcade unit in the world was perhaps a little more than they could handle, particularly as they'd never intended to actually manufacture machines. Dabney and Bushnell's original plan had been to contract designs out to other firms and let them build them, so they were really bootstrapping their manufacturing capacity from scratch. Demand was so fierce that over 70,000 ball and paddle games were sold in 1973, but Atari only had the capacity to meet 10% of that demand. This left ample room for competition to step in and cash in on the gold rush that they'd created. The arcade industry had been all about copycats since the early days of pinball, and Pong inspired imitation on a scale that hadn't been seen in decades. Atari's slow rollout at the end of 1972 allowed competitors to release clones before they could control the market, because one, Atari could only manufacture around a dozen units per day, and two, Pong was as easy to copy as it was to play, especially compared to other electromechanical machines with precisely calibrated analog components. Pong was entirely hardwired circuits, not programmed software, constructed entirely of easily available off-the-shelf parts. Anyone who acquired a machine could deconstruct it and, with a little research, figure out where all the parts were and who manufactured them. Established arcade manufacturers had the resources and expertise to produce their own versions on a scale Atari couldn't match, and even the integrated circuits were simple enough that you could contract out as many chips as you happened to need. The clones spread along with awareness of what Pong was and how well it was performing, starting with those firms on the west coast with access to Atari's initial slow rollout. Most successful of the early west coast copycats was Ramtech, Ironically, not involved with the arcade industry to begin with, they manufactured graphic displays and imaging hardware for the medical and aerospace industries, including CAT scans and tech for the Viking probe. Like Atari, they were heavily bootstrapping, using the profits from one project to fund the next. In an effort to break out of that cycle, their founder Chuck McEwen was on the lookout for simple projects to fund the business. Coincidentally enough, their CFO, Tom Adams, was part owner in Andy Capps, the tavern where Atari had been testing Pong originally, making it a favorite hangout for Ramtex engineers. They got a kick out of the game, and it was dead simple compared to their state-of-the-art imaging hardware. McEwen felt that they could put something similar into production to generate the cash flow they needed for their higher-end projects. So the month after Pong debuted nationwide... Ramtech was already ready to release their own version, Volley, followed up soon by their variations, Hockey and Soccer. Ramtech would go on to be the leader of the ball and paddle scene after Atari had moved on to other kinds of games, but it would never be more than a sideline, and the company would vanish from the industry long before the Golden Age began. We'll talk about Ramtech a bit more in a future video.
While the heart of the coin-op industry was in Chicago, the most successful Pong Klon manufacturer, selling more than anyone else, was Florida-based Allied Leisure. They were set about as far from Atari as you can get without actually leaving the country. Unlike Ramtech, Allied Leisure was already an arcade manufacturer. While they were far enough from Chicago that they couldn't take advantage of the parts manufacturing distribution networks, they were regarded as the leader in realistic solid-state driving games with audiovisual components. One of their most successful games was 1970's Wild Cycle, a motorcycle game that incorporated a soundtrack courtesy of an integrated 8-track player. When it came to Pong, that distance from Chicago's network worked in their favor as they'd had to build their own manufacturing supply chains and could source their own parts at cost. This made them the logical go-to when a distributor, fed up with Atari's inability to meet demand, sent them a Pong machine in the hopes that they'd put their own version into production. Adelaide Leisure's manufacturing VP Troy Livingston found the game's interior to be a mess of inefficient and fragile components haphazardly stuffed into a cabinet. Atari, of course, had no experience assembling coin-op machines, and had been building their assembly lines out of the otherwise unemployable. Bikers, drug addicts, college students, hippies. Livingston redesigned the mechanical components himself, and contracted the electronic circuit boards from Chicago's Universal Research Laboratories, or URL. Given their manufacturing capacity, Adelaide Leisure was ready to announce their own clone, Paddle Battle, not long after Ramtex Volley. They went on to produce units at 10 times the rate that Atari could, and at a cost per unit that gave them a pricing advantage when the Chicago operations finally joined the gold rush. Altogether, Allied Leisure sold 17,000 units. More devastatingly, after a few months, they released a four-player Pong called Tennis Tourney, beating even Atari's four-player version to market by two months. Even though Tennis Tourney didn't sell nearly as well as Paddle Battle, this destroyed the two-player Pong market just as the bigger films like Williams were gearing up, cutting the legs off the competition and forcing everyone to shift to four-player Pong. They made $11 million in 1973, dwarfing Atari's profits and their own combined earnings since their founding. This domination took a hit in January of 1974, however, when Allied Leisure's manufacturing plant was hit by a devastating fire. Livingston maintains that it was arson, that glass containers of gas had been thrown into the compressor rooms on opposite sides of the buildings at 4 a.m., but other sources cite electrical malfunction. Whatever the case is, Allied suffered a half million dollars in damages not covered by insurance, and putting them down for three months before production could be resumed. The Chicago companies entered the Pong game relatively late. As a reminder, Atari had offered Pong to Bally to fulfill their contract back in 1972. They and their subsidiary Midway had both passed on the game, thinking it too simple to fulfill the deal, but after seeing its success for Atari and Ramtech and Allied Leisure, Bally came back around seeking a license to produce its own version of the game. They were the only company to bother to do so instead of just making a clone, and they released Winner in April of 1973. It does well, and Bally has a strong manufacturing capacity, and they add a glass shield between the player and the game's monitor, an innovation that the industry will adopt game-wide for most of the rest of arcade history. The game does about as well as Atari's Pong had, and Chicago Coins and Williams clones do about as well. Puppy Pong was a limited Atari release that was less of a variant and more of a marketing gimmick aimed at pediatrician waiting rooms. It was a tabletop cabinet shaped like a yellow doghouse clearly inspired by Charles Schultz's Snoopy, possibly a licensing deal gone wrong or the result of a copyright infringement lawsuit. Barrel Pong was another repackaging for the upscale market, packaged into a wine cask. Europe, meanwhile, was dominated by clones to an even greater degree, as Atari lacked the capacity to set up international distribution. Uh, Nutting Associates had released Computer Space Ball in Britain, and Allied Leisure distributed their Paddle Ball game through London Coin. Amutronics TV Ping Pong was the first clone to reach France. The European markets were saturated by mid-year, and demand collapsed entirely. So the U.S. companies shift to soccer-themed games like Ramtech Soccer, Allied Leisure's Super Soccer, and Atari's World Cup. 
A few French, German, and Italian companies launched their own games, but the market remained flooded and distributors focused on more traditional coin-op machines. While everyone else was making Pong clones, Nolan Bushnell had turned Atari towards innovation. However, their attempts weren't doing very well, and he eventually accepted the reality of the market and, and, and focused on making Atari's own ball and paddle variations. By this point, however, Allied Leisure had killed the two-player market, so Atari released Pong Doubles in September of 1973, and in October, Elimination, a game where players are eliminated one by one if the ball hits their goal four times, last player standing winning. This was technically released by Key Games, but that's a complex subject that deserves its own episode. Maybe we'll talk about that next. Atari's last Pong variant, released in February of 1974, was Rebound, a volleyball game with paddles set against the bottom of the screen, arcing the ball back and forth over a net. The Cocktail Game was a new form factor for the Pong clone, introduced by Fascination Limited in October 1973. These were sit-down tables where patrons could play while ordering food and drinks, targeted at high-class bars, hotels, and cocktail lounges that were less open to amusements that discouraged patrons from indulging. The most successful cocktail game was Meadow Games' Flim Flam, selling 12,000 units between 1974 and 1976. It was a four-player variant using joysticks instead of dials, along with flim and flam buttons that could tweak the ball's trajectory in flight. It was one of the first games to offer difficulty settings in the form of different paddle lengths to give more skilled players a handicap. Ultimately, Pong's success kicked off the coin-op video game industry, bringing the arcade operators machines they could recoup their costs of their investments far more quickly and more surely than the earlier electromechanical games. Costs that they recouped in months rather than years. Prior to its release, the industry had been in a bit of a rut for years with few truly innovative ideas. Its success led manufacturers to copy Atari's Pong in a frenzied gold rush, flooding the market with copies of the exact same game, leading to disappointing returns, and many factories pulled out of the coin-op industry as a result. Interesting postscript. In 1974, Magnavox brought suit against Atari, Bally, Alley Leisure, Chicago Dynamic Industries, Seabergs, Williams, and Worldwide for patent infringements related to the Odyssey home video game system. Ralph Baer, the engineer who developed the Odyssey, had been rigorous in filing and documenting his patents from the date of his first 1966 proposal. These patents formed a legal claim to having invented the concept of video games itself, and more specifically, Pong-style paddle games. Magnavox had, if you recall from our earlier video, licensed the technology from Sanders Associates and bore the responsibility for any and all lawsuits. Most of the defendant companies settled, but oh no, not Nolan Bushnell. Our boy Nolan was powerfully offended at the idea that his arcade technology owed anything to Bayer's more primitive console, and launched a countersuit in 1975 to invalidate his patents. Cooler and more legally astute heads prevailed, and Atari decided that even if they won the fight, it would be financially ruinous. Instead, Bushnell settled for a small licensing fee up front. Magnavox didn't really take Atari seriously and was mostly looking to, to defend their intellectual property. As a result, Atari became their sole licensee in exchange for the rights to any product Atari came up with for the next 365 days. So, Atari decided not to release anything new for a full year. That's our Nolan! Thank you for taking the time to watch this video on the immediate impact of Pong and its clones. Next time, we'll be taking a closer look at Ramtech and their big hit, Clean Sweep.